I'm your host, Doug Sparks, editor-in-chief of Merrimack Valley Magazine. We're going to start off today, uh, Lou, with a uh, with a contest. We're giving away a pair of tickets oh, yeah. to see Jay Leno mm-hmm. at the Lowell Memorial Auditorium on April 2nd. And it's easy to get in on this contest. All you have to do is tag a friend, someone who you think might enjoy the content of this week's episode, or who is a Jay Leno fan, in the comments section. So you have to do it. You have to do it live. I'm going to pick our winner tonight around 5 p.m. So, uh, so a few rules. You have to live in the Merrimack Valley. Can't do it from California. So you have to <laughs> theoretically be able to go to this. Uh, and you cannot work for the magazine or oh. be a relative of anyone who wow. works okay. for the magazine. Sorry. That disappointed or, or, some people. As I told my wife, you can <laughs> enter. You just cannot win. <laughs> um, so anyways, yeah, tag a friend in the, the comments section and uh, win a pair of tickets to see Jay Leno and Lowell. How's everything going with you? Everything's going very well. It's Wednesday, so everything's very busy and very frenetic. So. Yeah, sure, sure. So we're just playing catch up all day long. Absolutely. Cool. You know, one of those days, you know those days as an editor when you feel like you're 10 minutes behind the whole day? I, I do. I, I'll have, I have to tell you, though, that this is, this is not one of those days for me because we just put out the March issue. Yeah, what is this day like? So this is, this is a sort of relaxing day and uh, week for me. Um, so I'm getting caught up on the easy stuff, the fun stuff. And it, the sort of stuff where if I told you I was doing it, you would think my job was, was cushy. <laughs> it's not cushy. I'm telling you. It's hard. But you wouldn't know it. Just if one you, or if two you days looked, a quarter, if you right? in on my desk today, you wouldn't yeah. see it. Because I'm doing, like I write the book reviews yep. or quite a few of the book reviews for the magazine. So I'm reading novels and taking notes and leisurely sipping tea yep. this afternoon. And, and things will start kind of cooking up again. Um, next week as we start to get closer listen, to our next set of deadlines two days a quarter you get to relax a little bit right it's cool yeah uh, we need it we need it <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah so uh you haven't asked the editor question yes. this week which i i sort of i got this question a couple weeks ago and i held it for today on purpose because i think our guest m- maybe might have some insights into it but i'll do my best and then we'll open it up yeah it's an interesting question too yeah. uh craig asks why don't they draw or create art like they used to that was both beautiful and terrifying at the same time you've posted some of the stuff in your stories yeah so what he's referring to is is my instagram so i'm, I'm on instagram is black river song and um for a time i was really into what they call like the folk horror genre big in England and it's just kind of a mix of kind of horror and folk tales and just folk art in general I like that and I was posting a lot of images yep. a lot more from the 60s and 70s um, and I just I haven't been doing it as much but maybe you can find examples you can you can google folk horror or folk horror art and see what people are doing uh, you know why why that stuff has an impact I mean it's it's things things that are obscure or unusual will always have a different impact than something you see all the time Mm -hmm. so part of it is that we just don't see that kind of stuff and then i also think all of that was made by hand right yeah so when you're looking there's a to me there's a different impact from from something that you see where someone took a brush and dipped it into ink and made something rather than took a mouse all right, right and start you know what i mean D- sure. digital changes the sort of effect and for some reason and it's it's i'm not an expert in this i just kind of think about it there seems to be something that when you move to digital you 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 lose touch with the unconscious mind that that's really? my feeling like it just yeah like in the 1960s people were reading carl jung and they were very much in this idea that there was some deep undersea force in your consciousness and then artists could tap into that and now everything is so rationalized like if you look at it like if you watch a film review Everything's, a, you know, the character's motive. This doesn't drive the plot. The character's motivations don't make sense. There's a problem with the plot. Yep. Well, you know, in a dreamlike, you know, there, there was a time where the, the concerns were more like, are you tapping into this sort of like dreamlike world of myth and where things have this power and the stuff that yeah. resonates beyond plot, you know, it, and it doesn't necessarily have to be rational. So in you fact, be- sometimes the rationality can kind of kill the stuff that he's talking about, which is like the uncanny. What makes something strange or unusual or have some sort of power that you can't just quite put into words? All right. So I was thinking visual when he said art. You're expanding that beyond to literary well, works. So and Actually, well, yeah. what he's really specifically probably talking about is a lot of book covers. Okay. Yep. Uh, book covers and, and illustrations for books. And when he so says, so if you look back at like the sci-fi books of the, oh, the right. 60s and 70s, or like, like the early, or like Mobius, the French uh, illustrator, a lot of that's just, it's just strange. It's very strange and, and weird, and in a yeah. in a great way where you're just looking at it. It's like, where did this come from? Where did this guy get these ideas? And what's this world I'm kind of peering into? 
Yeah, all this um, art from sci-fi in the fifties and sixties that was yeah. always this creature holding a holding a girl, and yeah, there was you a, know, lots of chaos going well, on, and yeah, you know, and a lot of it was very juvenile. But maybe that's okay. I mean, yeah. maybe not because it was sort of too much of that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's tapping into something that goes beyond just you know plot. Yeah, uh, with with a lot of that archetypes. Right, and that kind of art, movies, and even writing has become more everyday life mm. that's possibly gone awry as opposed to aliens landing yeah, or yeah. 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 Like giant creatures <laughs> sure. that type of thing. Yeah, exactly. Seems yeah. like a whole it's a reflection of our whole um the way we sit now. Uh, we're sitting in a different place than we were yep. in the fifties and sixties. Absolutely. For sure. Yep. Yeah, and you you always lose something and then you always kinda of gain something and and yeah, the terror we, here is interpersonal relationship. <laughs> the terror in the 50s and 60s were aliens well, and, so, and so, nuclear bombs. Okay, and, so yeah. you, uh, William Gibson, who's a sci-fi writer, has yeah. spoken about this recently. And he, he talked about how at a certain point as a writer, it became tough for him because he, he felt like, like, what do you mine for science fiction? Where do you get your ideas when we're already in the science fiction world? And then he had to, he had to build something new, yeah. right? So that, like, there's a certain pool that was exhausted by the time we get to um, Neuromancer and, and right. the stuff that the cyberpunk stuff people were doing in the, the 90s. Hmm. Um, maybe. I don't know. Maybe maybe our guest can, can chime in on yeah. this. Well, so our guest, I, let me introduce, uh, this is Susan Kap Kapusinski Gaylord. Did I get it right? Okay. Who is a calligrapher and an artist. Uh, if you can see, the uh, uh, one of her spirit books is on the, the table here. Um, and she's written a memoir. I'm going to hold it up if you don't mind. And this is called Calligraphy, How I Fell In, Out, and In Love Again. And the reason why I saved this question for you is because everything you're doing is, like, it, this is digital because it's a digital, you know, print. But everything you're doing is with brushes and, and with your own hands. Yes. Is there a difference between something done digitally from your experience versus... I mean, I've done some work digitally as well. And it seems to me that... Um, well, it was really interesting to me because I did, the spirit books are something I've been making for a long time. I just, this is like number 93. Okay. I've just, I'm working on 101 now. Okay, long time meaning since the early since 90s. The early 90s, okay. 1992 I started. Okay. But I did a whole series, I for a while there I was doing things with photographs of taking from flowers and then extracting pieces and then doing kind of kaleidoscope things and actually mm. I brought something from there. I think maybe not. Nope. Yeah, here. So these are all digital images that I created from ah, photographs. Okay, but the this the, but the lettering the, was the, done. The by lettering hand. is done by hand. And, but everything else was was created digitally. Okay. And is there a difference in the creative process? Do you feel not really? Hmm. And I remember thinking, being surprised at how connected I felt with nature, working on these on a screen with a photograph. The experience was not that much different from mm. working with the natural materials yeah. themselves. Well, creative people are creative. You give them scissors, you give them the brush, mm -hmm. you give them a computer, mm -hmm. they're going to be sort of creative mm -hmm. with it. And yet at the same time, so one of the points, I think I made this in the, the review mm -hmm. um, of the memoir, is that uh, like if you hand letter an Emily Dickinson poem mm -hmm. and then read the print version, yeah. it's a different experience. Yes, yeah, and that's hopefully, yeah, that's yeah. that makes it worth and there's a different, you know, like emotional yeah. something. And mm -hmm. there's there's also something in hand lettering where there's not, I don't mean mistakes in a bad way, but there's human elements. Right. Right. There's cracks. There's mm -hmm. things that, that a very almost like imperceptible sense of imbalance or something mm -hmm. that is a good thing. Right. Yeah. That, that's hard to get in, in digital art. Right. No, I, I agree. That, well, the, the other thing, which I don't want to get off on this tangent, because it's not someplace I may ever get. Okay. But I actually have done a little bit of exper experimenting with VR, hmm. virtual reality. Really? And I've had a couple of experiences where I was lettering in space in this kind of virtual thing, and it was just the coolest thing. Ah. But I can't, it's, I can't do all the technology that's built around it. I don't know that I mm -hmm. want to learn. So I'm not sure where to go with it. But... It's something that I'm really interested in. It was just, it was just amazing to be yeah, yeah. like sort of writing in the air. Yeah. So you embrace so, that. So when someone so says, yes. "Hey, the, the art used to be, you know, kind of better and have this like soul, and the soul has right. kind of gone away," do you have that sense, or you're like, "No, full speed ahead into the future"? 
Yeah, I think both. You know, I, mean, okay. I wouldn't want to take away one. I wouldn't want to live in a virtual world. Sure. But, um, but I think there's room room for it all. Yeah. So let's uh, let's start at the beginning. How did yeah. you get into calligraphy? Uh, I had dabbled it with it in high school. Hmm. Uh, a friend of mine was did it in his art class. He gave me a couple of materials. I started to play with it. So it was something I did a little bit here and there. But I never really, when I was working on the book, it was interesting to kind of look back. And I, I got rid of tons of work over the years, but I actually kept a surprising amount. Yeah. So I was able to look at old examples. But, it, but then I really didn't understand anything about it. I just... Hmm. Um, I just did it, you right. know. I, I mean, I just copied pictures and books, and I didn't really understand the underlying. And then, in my late, I was in my late twenties. It was 1978. I was unemployed, and I was collecting unemployment. I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. And a friend from high school remembered I did it and asked me if I could letter something for a friend. Hmm. And I got out the materials I had. I started to do it, and then I just became completely hooked. Yeah. So. Um, what was the process like in the beginning? How did you learn? Uh, I learned from. I can't, one of the things I thought of was I can't remember whether I intentionally didn't look for a class or I had looked and I didn't find one, but I ended up working on my own from books. Hmm. Uh, so I pretty, I, I don't like to say I taught myself because the books were my teachers. So yeah. it's not like in a vacuum you just right. do all this. But I didn't have somebody kind of guiding me or correcting me as yeah. I worked. Uh, yeah, I think you mentioned in the memoir that, that your discipline at this time, because you have to just write these letters over and over, over. and over again, mm -hmm. came from swimming. When I thought back, it was like I was a competitive swimmer. You just mm. swim back and forth in the pool. You know, you do miles a day. And, yeah, yeah. And it's, there's a lot to that. And you're, you're repeating a limited set of movements that you're doing over and over again and trying to make adaptation adjustments, yeah, yeah. corrections. So I think there's similarity. And when I was, when I was teaching it, um, I used to say that it, it was a lot more like learning how to play an instrument. Mm -hmm. Than maybe learning how to draw or something, because you're you're working. I mean, there's 26 letters in the alphabet, but that's it. So you're working with those same, and um, I think it can be. I mean, I, I don't. I remember a certain level of frustration, but I don't remember like enormous frustration. Yeah. And it's not like I was so great, but I just really enjoyed doing it. And then the other thing I think that was a factor in that was I was an English literature major, and I loved words. Mm -hmm. So. The fact that you were writing word, it, you know, the, you're worried about the letters, but you're writing words. Yeah. And you're thinking about the words. So early on, you were doing quotes and you were doing stuff with a literary yes. aspect. Yes. And I, when I look back, a lot of my earlier things were like complete poems, um, and much more, much more, what you study in English. Yeah. Less yeah. contemporary, I would say. My taste has become yeah. more contemporary in what I write. Hmm. So, I, and I think I emailed you about this, but your your book kind of shamed me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you remember me telling you this, uh, because my handwriting is so okay. bad. It's always been bad. Like, I remember, like, teachers, like, ruthlessly <laughs> making fun of me in high school. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's just like, well, what is, is there anything I can do now? So I, I wrote to you about it, and then I got some some nice pens, and I got some books, and I started mm -hmm. doing this practicing, which I liked. And I think my handwriting has gotten slightly better. Well, the one of the things is the... To me, like the great thing about calligraphy is that it's also connected to handwriting. So one of the things is as you're learning, it's not like it's something that's removed from your life. I mean, less now because people do so much. You know, a lot of people just keep their shopping lists on the on their iPhone, yeah. on their phone, and all that kind of stuff. But then it was so it became it becomes something that you can be practicing and learning in an isolated thing. But then you can also be just adapting your handwriting. Yeah. So and then I did calligraphy really seriously for almost 10 years, and then I moved away and did books for, <clears throat> I'm not good at math, but whatever, <laughs> 20, 25, yeah. and, then, um, and then I came back to it. But in that time, it wasn't like I never picked up a pen. Yeah, Ever. right, right. I was using it all the time, so I was still kind of in the game. It yeah. wasn't. Do you, do you mind if I pull something out of here no, that I noticed? Because I wanted to ask you about it, and I think it, it relates to this before we get to the spirit books. Where's the, the journals? Journals. The journal stuff. Right, here. Okay. So, uh, Lou, how does this look? It looks great. Can you see this? Yeah. Fan okay. So, for people who don't know what this is and maybe are just listening, what, what am I holding up here? You're holding up a piece from a series I did that was called Childbirth Journey. So, I had been doing quotes of other people. I had been interpreting other people's yeah. And when work. was this about? This was 1986. Okay. So, in 1985, uh, and, and it was a time when I was really... I don't know that I had the words quite for it. This was sort of in the process of the beginning of falling out of love with calligraphy. Hmm. And part of it was that I didn't want to, 
I was interpreting the words of other people and I tried to do kind of enhance the viewer's experience of those words but they were definitely somebody else's words and I think I was getting restless that I really wanted to do something that was completely mine hmm. so this just happened to come along I mean I didn't do this intentionally say oh, I've got to do something of mine I'm yeah. going to do this but I um, so 1985 my mother died suddenly in January and my first child was born in June so hmm. it was like a really difficult time and really tumultuous and then I had kept kind of a journal through haphazardly I mean not an everyday thing but I would written things through my pregnancy um, written stuff about it after the birth which was a cesarean which was not m my plan hmm. and I was not happy um, and then afterwards so this is part of that series so then I did abstract pastel drawings to go with the text and calligraphy and this is actually what led me away. So I did an exhibit at, um, at the Newburyport Art Association, had all 15 pieces, they were framed. They were decent size on the wall. And when I brought them home, I didn't want to just hang them on the wall because they just weren't the kind of thing you wanted to look at every day. It was great mm. to go to the exhibit, you kind of experience it, but then you don't want, it's, not, it's just not like a painting you put on the right. wall. So that was what led me to start looking for a more intimate format for the work if I was going to be this personal and that led me into the book handmade mm -hmm. book which then eventually left words behind yeah so uh, so tell us about these books you can see an example mm -hmm. here on the on the table uh, what are we what are we looking at and so what are we... I call them spirit books they're books so everything is handmade in the book I mean every page has content in the sense that there's pattern and stitching or something but they're meant to be like a meditative experience to go through it it's not there's no narrative, there's no beginning or end. Mm. And they started from, and that had started actually in 19... It started when we did a massive pruning at our house, and I had all of these sticks and branches and vines and things, and I just felt... Why did you have those things? Because we had pruned everything. Oh, oh so, yeah, so okay, I, so literally I, like, I, like, you really, literally were pruning. I literally was okay. pruning, all and right. then we ended up with like a 10-foot high mountain, in mm. our, and we had to cut them up and, to get rid of them. And I started to feel just this kind of sense of in, some kind of inner life to them. And so I brought a whole lot of it to the studio. And then it took me four years of experimenting with different kinds of things. And I had already been making books, but it never sort of dawned on me to put them together. And then one day I just did it. Mm -hmm. And um, then I knew it was something that I wanted to do a continuous. So right away I kind of gave it a name and a number and put it right. part of, of a series. Were you studying different sort of printmaking traditions, or did this all come organically from the materials? It came pretty organically from the materials. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, I think it came. It, it just sort of came, and that's been, that was kind of a real turning point mm -hmm. for me in my, my work in general, because I got to think that I really like working this way. I really like working where I don't have a plan, I don't yeah. have a sketch, that it just happens. So I've tried to, since I've come back to calligraphy, I've tried to keep that same approach. Okay. Um, yeah, because you see, I, and for, I just want to make the point maybe visually, we'd start off something more like this. Yeah. This is from Song of Solomon. And then you get into the journals. Yeah. With some pastel and yeah. color and starting to move into okay. some type of abstraction. And now the words fall away with the spirit right. books. Yeah. Which is, for someone who, who starts the journey with words mm -hmm. as the primary mm -hmm. focus mm -hmm. to, you know, to completely move away. Mm -hmm. Like what was, what was your, well, were you took, aware of this happening? It, it took like, a while and I will say, I just have a thing um, here somewhere. Do I have it here? No, maybe I don't have it. Anyway, I did, I, so I moved away. I started to do a lot with a photocopier. Hmm. I don't think it's here. Um, these, are, these images are in the book. Yes, I know everything what you're is in about. the book. The okay. book yeah, the, if you, uh, just so you can take. The book has 277 images. There's a lot of images lot. and a lot of color images here. So you can see what we're talking about at all different mm -hmm. stages of this. These are what you're talking about right here, right? With the, the photocopier? Uh, well, the, the, no, yeah, the, well, yes, I did these. So I did the, when I did the childbirth journey large in color then I did a smaller version of black and white but all of this is just developed from putting things on a photocopier copying them and then wow. and then printing them but one yep. of the pieces actually with the book and this is was kind of the, a real turning point so I thought I had a picture but this this you can't see too much of it here but this is a book hmm. with just some imagery on it okay. and I 
wrote on the back. So this was, it had, it's, the pictures were combinations of lips from um, Buddha from Angkor Wat, and I, ha I was leasing a photocopier. My son and I made an alphabet book. I put my ear on the, we put our ears on the photocopier so we could, for the letter E. And then I found out that I had gray hair. <laughs> um, and then I was, so, and then this was like maybe two or three years after my mother had died. I was, I was doing a lot of thinking about meaning of life, life and death, all that kind of thing. So I kind of viewed it as the gray hair is a symbol of sort of aging and f the finiteness of life. The Buddha may be more a, a thing of the eternal life, but yet this is from an old statue that's kind of coming apart yeah. and that there is a sense of the eternal in everything. Right. So I wrote, on the back of it, I wrote a text related to that. And then a friend of mine who was a poet came over, looked at it and said, I could just look at this for a long time. I can see a lot. This is, there's a lot of, you know, the page, I can just see a lot in here. And I thought, why am I telling what to think? And so that, I think, was the critical break-off point where I was like, if I'm moving into this other thing where I'm working with materials, and if, if this is based on, like, the art of it and the image of it, then... I shouldn't be explaining it. I should. Part of it is a is a bit of a crutch. I mean, it's like here's to this, but I'm going to explain it for you just so you make sure you get right, it. Right, right. But it's like no, I can let that go and let it stand on its own. Mm -hmm. And then the spirit books came, not exactly right, but I mean they it led into that. And by that time, I was ready to say you don't need words. Yeah. How did the spirit books themselves evolve over time? Well, they're they're fairly similar. Well, one of the things is that I kept a lot of them with me for a long time. So if I came up with so originally they originally they only had just like a flat piece that they rested on, mm -hmm. and then I decided originally I don't think, even think they had a base at all. Okay. Then I decided they should have a base. So then I made flat bases. So you made these bases. Yes. Mm. So then I decided. So then I did another piece separate to it, and I did something where I had a raised base. And I thought, well, that really is a good thing. That kind of elevates them. And I do think of them with a certain level, some, some kind of sacredness. So that kind of make, mm. gives them like an altar for them. So then I went back, and anything I already had, I remade the base for. And then I kept on doing that in the future. So, um, so I kind of go back. I look at them as, so I've gone, so they all, I think, I like to think the new ones are, the newer ones are maybe a little better than the old ones. But there's really not that much progression because I keep mm -hmm. I will go back and rework something to bring okay. it. So they kind of think of them all as a as a unit yeah. in a way, even though they get dispersed. Right. I like to think of them as sure compa all compatible with each mm -hmm. other. And then at a, at a certain point, something brings you back to to words and to calligraphy. Yes. Um, well, I decided in 2005. I decided that I was I had made 50, and I decided that I was going to stop. I don't know. For some reason I just felt like I needed to. So then I was like a lost soul because like my work, I am an artist. That's what I do. I've been doing this for a long time. And I was also teaching bookmaking in schools, which is what I was doing hmm. kind of for the business side of what I did. And what sort of schools would you be? I go to elementary schools, okay. just all over. Oh, okay. So just like public schools, mostly public schools. Oh. And um, I would go in and spend a day. And it was a pretty intensive program because I'd see people, I would often see 50 kids at a time. I'd see like three or 400 kids a day. It was pretty intense. Yeah. How did they respond to this? Really well. I mean, we didn't make these. We made, and I made, it was, I really, I tried to make what I was doing as valuable to schools as I could. So they would, so teachers would tell me what they were studying that they'd like to use a book for. And then I'd choose a form to teach that was appropriate for the age and mm. that would fit with, that they could do a pro. And I usually would make a sample like, hey, you could do this with your book. Yeah. Um, words. Okay. So anyway, but when I stopped doing the spirit books, then I was kind of lost. So I, I took a class in Chinese brush painting, which I wasn't, like, I didn't really care about that, but I ended up kind of loving words again. Hmm. I mean, lo loving ink. Yeah. So then that sort of said anything. And then I did a, I do, I, I participated for, for quite a few years in outdoor sculpture at Maudsley, which is at Maudsley State Park in Newburyport. Hmm. And I did a piece with ink. Um, which so was, when you say you participate, what is it for people who don't know? It's a it's an outdoor it's like kind of like an open outdoor sculpture show that is planned ahead, but it's a very kind of a grassroots show. So there's usually like thirty to forty sculptures, 
Mm -hmm. that people just put up for, it's like it runs for three weeks at Maudsley State Park in September. Okay. And it's a wonderful. And it happens every year. It's it happens to, so every it's going to happen this September. It's going to happen this okay. September as well. Great. And actually there's going to be a show at the firehouse in Newburyport um, of kind of a retrospective because this year will be the 20th. Last year, I think, was the 20th mm -hmm. year. Very cool. Uh, so anyway, so that led me, and then I wanted to take part in it, but I didn't have any ideas, and so I thought, well, I like words. You know, I could go back to something that I was comfortable with. So yeah. I did some, some pieces there, and then that just led me to kind of get more interested in words. Yeah. And then I feel like part of it now, in the last several years, has been that I, I think the spirit books have a lot to say for where we are today in terms of connecting with nature, but it does feel a little bit apart from kind of the political discourse. Mm. And I feel like words are something that are kind of touchstones for me. Like there's something that I kind of need. Sure. Uh, so I think that that's part of the reason that like that I've words have been more important. And actually, I have. Well, there's some other things we can. Yeah. Well, this is a series that I did. This was an exhibit that I did in in Connecticut. Mm. And so the idea of this, well, this is not so much political, but it's just giving you some words to just kind of hang on to, to to remember, and maybe you know when you're having a really crappy day yeah. to just say, oh, I could think about it this way, or. Sure. Um, but this is one. So one of the things is I I kind of have this thing that I'd like to take up more space. Yeah. So these are these are four and a half feet wide by six and a half feet long. And these I did, I lettered kind of with an audience. So I had everything set up, the paper set up. But I went to the gallery and I would, I like lettered it and then we hung it up and then I lettered it and mm -hmm. hung it up. So it was kind of a spontaneously, I wasn't spontaneous in the fact that I actually practiced. Like, so for this as an example, like I didn't do a sketch for this, I never worked smaller, but I did practice. So I would have long, less quality paper, but I was, I practiced each one of these multiple yeah. times. And so for people who are just listening, there's, there's the giant sheets of paper with, with small quotes. Huh. There's one from Adore Wealthy and there's one from Whittier and who's Kerouac. that? Kerouac. Uh, the Kerouac one, believe in the holy contour of life. Is the first one. So that's what we're looking at, is kind of short, yep. emphatic. Right, and, and also because you can't fit, if you want to write big, you can't fit that many words on that. <laughs> yeah, right. So there's always, so one of the things is there's a practicality to a lot of things. And yeah. when, you know, I'm going to pick a quote, but it's it's too long, so right. I have to pick a different one. Yeah. But that's a that's a favorite. That's, he, he there's the, um, I don't know, like 30 things of writing poetry, his rules for writing poetry, and that's that's one of them. Was he a big uh, influence on you? Is he a big influence? He, I, I did, I've done a lot of work around him, and so I would say yes. I mean, going back and rereading some things now with, I would say, even though I was, thought I was a feminist then with a more feminist conscience, like On the Road is pretty, there's some excruciating passages sure. in there. But yes. Yeah, I, I taught that in, I taught college English for a while, mm -hmm. and I taught at a time when, when the, the stuff that you would think about is like, ah, oh, this book changed my life I've, and it makes me want to hit the road. They, people, the students were not at all interested in it. Yeah. And they just sort of saw it as a guy taking, uh, you know, young underage girls up, a, into the, I, up into the hills. Right. So, <laughs> but I felt like there was a lot of, of other that I saw in him. And he was definitely a seeker and a, mm. and a person with a strong spiritual. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and I mean, he... Kind of, he suffered a lot. I mean, it wasn't like his life was a bowl of cherries. Right. Sure. So he was just cavalierly going in, yeah. treating women badly. I mean, he was he was a mess right, in right. a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, but yes, he was very influential. And because I lived, so I lived in the Lowell area. For I, we lived there from, so I started doing the calligraphy in 78. I was living in North Billerica, just outside of Lowell. And I, um, we moved to Newburyport in 1985. So I was. Are you in Newburyport now? Yes. Okay. So I really kind of, I did a lot, really kind of connected with Kerouac then, and a lot more of the reading that I did, um, I had read on the road before, but I but I was more interested in his Lowell work, hmm. which is just it's pretty amazing that how, you know, there aren't that many towns and cities that get that kind of attention paid to them by writers. Right. Right. So. At some point, you conceive of writing a memoir, right? Did you conceive of it? Did somebody say, "Hey, wouldn't it be great if you uh, if you wrote all this down?" And no, in 1978, I did some math and I realized that it was 40 years since I had been doing calligraphy, mm -hmm. and I thought I should do something to mark that occasion. Yeah. So I did 40. So 
because I'm crazy, I, did, I said, oh, I will do, so then I will do 40 blog posts. Okay. Not just a few, but I'll do 40. So I did 40. So for a person who doesn't, you claim you're not good at math, right. numbers still matter to you. Numbers still matter, I okay. guess, yeah. Right. So I decided, right. well, I like symmetry. I like things to sort of line up. So uh. I, I said, well, I'll do 40 blog posts. So then after I did the 40 blog posts, it seemed like, hey, there's, there's one, this, I think this was of some interest, and I posted it on my blog, I posted it on Facebook, and a lot of people responded. So I thought, you know, I think I should turn this into a book. And I've done other book projects. Like I've done, a, I did a catalog of the spirit books. I did a catalog of the Emily Dickinson ones. So I've done, um, so I'm familiar with, so I was able to like handle the whole process. So I was able to design the book to do everything. Yeah, yeah. Which helps. Yeah. And, and so the whole thing, I, I really viewed it as like my, I mean, it was another art project. Yeah. Uh, so what was the process like uh, writing the memoir? Well, I'd already written a lot of it for the blog. So it was post. coming from your blog. And by the way, uh, SusanGaylor.com yeah. is your, your website, and that's yeah. where people can read your blog. Yeah, they, there's right. a link to that there. Okay, yeah. all right. So I, so I wrote a lot of it there, and then I thought, oh, I'll just turn that into, you know, I'll just take the blog post and reprint Were it. Were you working with an, an editor? I worked with, uh, I did it primarily on my own, but I had, a lo I had help from Paul Marion, okay. who's a friend of mine who's a local yeah. poet and publisher. So he, we went back and forth a lot. So okay. he, he, I mean, it's beautiful. The reason I ask it's beautifully written. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is my job is editing mm -hmm. stuff, and I just really like to, you know, spend time with your sentences. <laughs> it was really great uh, and very um, minimal at times. Mm -hmm. And and I, I always felt, and I think I said this in the review, mm -hmm. that you would suggest something. And there was a lot going on underneath mm -hmm. the the surface. Mm -hmm. So I was just for, but it, you know, there wasn't a lot of discussion up until that point of of about your writing. So where do, where do your skills... Well, I was an English literature major. Okay. For starters, which is helpful. Yeah. But then it was actually my kids... I've had a blog for a long time. Mm. And I can't remember when I started, but my kids were like, you should have a blog. Like you, you know, you write. And so I think that that definitely got me more interested in writing. And then I had actually written a little book called Art Lessons, which were like seven quotes and then kind of lessons that I had learned from art from it. And then I've done a lot of I've done a lot of writing to kind of sort things out, and a lot of it's specific to my work. Yeah. Because being an artist is not that easy. Um, so when, in between. Not that easy because there's a lot of self doubt and, uh, and what's different. Well, for me, to someone who says ha ha ha, how how dare she say that? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, for, I mean it. I would say that I have a. I have a pretty, my relationship with the work itself is not that complicated. It's pretty straightforward and I think it's kind of, I don't have a lot of anxiety about that. Um, in the beginning I had a lot of self-doubt about calligraphy, but I've kind of gotten through that. But mm. interface, the interface of the work and, and the rest of the world and how to get it out there and how to all do all that stuff, I have found hard. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a difficult thing to do and I've always done work that is a little bit, not, I tend to do things that don't quite fit in one convenient category. So like the spirit books, they're, they fit in the category of artist books and I exhibit them as that, but there are people who collect artist books who want things that are more like a book. Mm -hmm. And then I also have exhibited a sculpture, but there are people say who collect sculpture who are looking for something more metal ceramic, more traditionally like a sculpture piece. Right. So it doesn't quite fit. So the, so this book doesn't quite fit. I mean, it's a memoir, but it's full of illustrations, so yeah. it's, it, but it's not really a catalog of my work. So anyway, I always do things. So it's always been hard for me to, to figure out where my work fits. Yeah. And then just being, you know, putting yourself out there is, is hard work. Sure. And figuring out how, and it's not that hard to get it out there. Like, I'm pretty good at get people to see what I do and pay attention to me. I'm really bad at getting people to buy anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's an interesting book because I think someone, I, I knew about the Spirit Books because we had published something okay. in Merrimack Valley Magazine about it. Um, so I knew a little bit about you. I didn't know anything about this. Uh, I'm sort of interested in calligraphy because I like kind of Asian mm -hmm. culture and things like that and tea and mm -hmm. that the tea tradition, the, the calligraphy tradition mm -hmm. run hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it's like, it, so it's a book about calligraphy, but this isn't going to teach you how to right. make, make a better G. Right. This is about something else. Right. So for someone who is not interested in the topic, they have to be prepared that this is this goes well beyond 
calligraphy is, right. is about something about the artistic process, There's, about learning and about engaging mm -hmm. with the world. And it's also a book about, I think, about this region, mm -hmm. right? Because yes. as you're going through this process, it's grounded in a particular We're place. And you're, you're writing, you did the cover for the Lowell General Hospital what was it like the patient's guide yeah, yeah. in the 1970s it, yeah. so your work is all over and you're also like there's some great pictures of you at, at different uh you know <laughs> venues um going back in the merrimack valley really? yeah no i there was a, there's a picture of me at uh, i think the lowell farmer's market yeah. I, had a, I had a little table there with the next i was always next to a beekeeper and a farmer so. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> okay um so i wanted to ask a few things um this weekend there's a croning ceremony you wrote about in your blog? Yes. What is that? So it is, um, so it's part of Lowell Women's Week. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it with two friends. And it is, so there is a tendency, well, I think the popular conception of a crone is not a positive one. Right. It's a hag, it's old, it's ugly, it's, it's a woman. So this is, but yet the tradition was not always that way. Mm -hmm. That women, older women were respected, the crone was a term of honor. Right. And a thing. So this is a way of ta kind of reclaiming that word. Okay. And accepting one, accepting aging, but also accepting all the good things, the good things that come with aging, the wisdom, the experience, and kind of taking your place as an elder in the community. Hmm. So it's a beautiful. It's it's a beautiful. It's, it's a two-hour event. It's it's a beautiful. I think it's a really beautiful ceremony, and it's. I find that it. I think I wrote in there like it's. It's both personal and communal, so you're making this kind of statement for yourself, but it's really nice to share yeah. with other women. So it's open to the public. It's at Middlesex Community College in their lower cafe on Sunday from 2 to 4. Okay, and who's um, Ann Mulvey Ann from Mulvey. UML? She's a she, UML psychology professor? She was in the community psych department. Okay, or psych, and yeah, she's psych, involved with this? She's involved with this. She's she's um, Professor Emerita. Um, but yes, yeah, she's involved in it, and then another friend of ours, okay. Irene Egan. We're going to put it in the, the comment section, we'll, so we'll link it if, if people want to check out and, and learn more. Mm -hmm. You did the poster, I too, did the so poster. They, get to, they get to see more of your, um, of your work. Um, and then I could just put in play for Lowell Women's Week. Tomorrow I'm okay, going to be giving a, a talk at um, the Lowell, the UMass Lowell, the Center for Women and Work, and it's uh, how an English literature major became an artist. So it's a lot of what we've talked about here, but these, as a matter of fact, these images that I've been holding up, we've been holding up, are ones that I did for that talk. Yeah. And then next Tuesday, I'm giving a talk at the Newburyport Library at seven okay. o'clock. Yeah, and, and just in case people are driving, a easy way to find this out. We're going to put it in the comments mm -hmm. section, and also we added this information into the article on mm -hmm. or into the review mm -hmm. of this. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at the digital version, if you look at our website mm -hmm. and look up the calligraphy review, just search for calligraphy, you'll see all the upcoming, because there's more than that too, right? Do you have yeah, something, and then I have something, you have something in April? I have something in April, April 9th. And uh, what's that? That's a talk again, and that's at the Lowell, Lowell uh, the Pollard Memorial Library in Lowell. Okay. And that one is going to focus a little bit more on kind of my Lowell history, because that was really pivotal. I happened to be there. That was right when the National Park first became a, when yeah. Lowell first became a National Historical Park. So there was a lot, there was kind of like a, it's nothing like the, the sort of the art scene in Lowell today, but there was definitely yeah. a, a cultural happening at sure. the time. Uh, so my last question for you yeah. um, is the effect of YouTube. Mm -hmm. Because as I was reading this and thinking about mm -hmm. reviewing, I got on YouTube and I was sort of amazed at how many calligraphy and handwriting stations there were, yep. channels. Yep. Do you watch any of that? Are you aware of what's going on in that community? Somewhat. Um, there's some really good stuff and there's some really bad stuff. Yeah. Like everything <laughs> right. out there. But, it, but the popularity of it. It's, it's I mean, some well, of these channels get massive yes. amounts well, of views. Well, it's interesting because there are, there are several, there are different ways of doing calligraphy and there's a thing now called, usually people call modern calligraphy which is, I would say, easier, and it's more of a drawn letter than a letter that depends on pen angle. Okay. And so there's a, there's a lot of... What, is the, what does that mean, so for someone who... Well, so you hold... The way that... This is one of the things that drew me, like the magic of it, was that if you... The, the lettering that I do is based on if you hold the pen at a certain angle, which is specific to that style, you keep it consistent, and the thicks and the thins that form and all of that just happen automatically. There's no pressure, there's no changing and twisting of the pen. So that's one style. And then there's pointed pen, which is 
working with a pen, but you're but it's pressure that is making the fix in the things. Right. And then modern calligraphy is more like you kind of it's more like handwriting, and then you go back and draw in the thickening, mm -hmm. which is a little easier. Yeah. But one of the things I think that's I, I think that people are looking for like people spend so much time on their screens that well two things have happened one the fact that people are aware of that letters are different that you can choose different fonts has given people a much greater sensitivity to looking at letters and how something's written than they were before computers so that's one thing the other thing is that people just spend so much time on screens that they really are looking for something to do with their hands yeah right and so you know that that makes it attractive and then that makes um, I mean, typewriters have, have a resurgence. Hmm. You know, my daughter has a typewriter. She makes cards with a typewriter. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, so there is a sense of just wanting some sense of not just on the screen. Right. So to someone listening now who says, that makes sense, I want to get off my screen, I want to use mm -hmm. my hand and do something more tactile, what do you normally recommend to beginners to get involved? Um, I think if you can get involved in handwriting to start with, okay. that's a really good way. Do you recommend certain things they buy, a certain book? A well, certain... there are two. The book that I learned from is still in print. It's called The Italic Way to Beautiful Handwriting by Fred Eager. And it's a workbook, so you're going through workbook. And then the other workbook is called Right Now, and it's by Barbara Getty and Inga Dubay. And they are based in Portland, in Oregon. And they have been on the forefront of italic handwriting as rather than say the Palmer method or something else and they have a whole program for training children for teachers to use with children and they have a book for adults and they're just developed they either, I think they've just developed um, a program for iPads so that kids can be learning that style yeah. on their iPad so those I think that handwriting is a good entry point hmm. um, and then other than that there are there are some videos online. I think Secura is the marker company, and Joanne Fink is the person who's done them. Um, Reggie Ezell, E Z E L L, has a. So some of the people have ones that you. They have a little bit of information for you, and then you. Then they have a paywall to get to more in depth right. thing. But there's some really. There is some good stuff out there. Mm. And if you want to play around, I mean, if you want to do, you know sort of my approach, then that is the broad, broad edge pen. But if you want other things, you can look. But um, What's the cost? Like if someone, if a 18 year old person says, I, I'm kind of broke, how much would it cost to, to get into this and start, start work? 20 bucks. 20 bucks, okay. If, or less. So you, the pens are not, they're, you don't have to buy the fanciest you know, and imported so, I mean, from Japan. You could Japan. do a fountain pen. I, I actually have started, I thought I wouldn't, wouldn't do this, but a lot of people have asked me about calligraphy and said they're interested since yeah. I, I, since they've read the book. So I actually am doing some classes that, uh, and I'm just using a marker to get started. So I did, I did a five hour class at Rocky Neck Cultural Center in Gloucester that went really well. And so my thing is just giving the introduction of things, so getting, kind of setting people on their path. Yeah. But then from there, I don't want to be an ongoing teacher. So sure. it's just like right. set you on your path and go. But you can even start with markers. I mean, you don't have to, um, you could buy a, like a cartridge pen it's, that's like a, you know, kind of like a fountain pen, or you could just start with markers and just see what you think. Yeah. So yeah, this came out in 2019. Yes. And your your artistic life has been sort of focused on this. Yes. Since then, what um, what are you looking forward to in the future? Where's your work? Have you thought about where your work is going to take you in well later part of this year, 2021? Well, I have a couple spirit books that I have the kind of the wooden cradle set. So there's a, a couple books that I really want to get. Go so I want to keep. Because I've taken, taken a break from that. I want to do some more spirit books. I would mm -hmm. like to do more installation kind of work. I'm trying to figure out something to possibly do um, for Earth Day. Okay. Um, I have an. Have idea. you thought about where? I'm thinking of Newburyport. I have to like kind of ask permission if it would work out. But I'm, I'm right. my pl my idea is to work on just get cardboard from an appliance place and work on that so it's recyclable and part of nature. And then I have an I thought, I'm not sure if I'll get to it, but I'm thinking I would like to do some kind of a project for women's suffrage, which August 18th is the, hmm. the day of the 100th anniversary. Yeah. Um, and, and once again, for people who are driving or, or do, who don't have their calligraphy <laughs> pen at the ready, um, 
you can find out all this information on your uh, website, susangaylord.com. Yep. That's right. Uh, Lou, do you have any questions for our guest? Yes, I want to go back to the spirit book. <laughs> I, I knew. We always ask questions. <laughs> I, I hear the gears turning. I want to go back to the spirit books. And yeah. for someone for whom words and conveying thoughts is so important, talk about the transitions, the spirit book, where words are taken out of your hands, you no longer have the weapon. Mm -hmm. And are you trying to convey thoughts with the spirit books, or is this interpretive, like a song lyric? Put it in front of somebody and let them arrive at their own thoughts. I think that's part of it, but I, I, I mean, I love words, but I think sometimes they can get in the way. Yeah. And I feel like if you want, that that just gives an intermediary between a more direct experience. But did you give up control of the message? In other words, is this for the and use it to create their own message out, or are you still trying to tell them something, just not using words to do it? Uh, I guess I'm trying to, well, what I'm trying, what I think I'm trying to say and why I name them spirit books is that there is, that nature has, it's more than, it, it, there's more to it than just, like that stick, the stick is more than just a stick. Yep. That, and, that, and that there is this sense of interconnectedness with everything. So that's what I'm bringing to it, and hopefully people will get it but i you know i mean when you put something out there writers are so used to con writers are so used to controlling the message or attempting to control mm -hmm. the message it can be difficult to let go yeah i felt like with this um well that transition when i re when i s kind of pasted over the writing i had done on that other book it was kind of like there is a difference in some things you need to let yep. speak for themselves because i love to and i kind of think for me writing is more I write to try to figure things out, and I write to try to understand things. Like I think there's a level at which the book is trying to work that out, and this is just like no, I'm not. Tr I'm just trying to. It's just about the experience. It's yep. not about thinking. Hmm. Great. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much for for being here and talking. And I love this book. And and I wrote a glowing review. I, I think I, I just read it this because morning because I love the book. It, it's because wonderful. I love the book. It's a fantastic book. So um, and you can people can get the book on through your website, right? Well, or is there a best way? What's well, the... it's it's on Amazon. Okay. And it's a print on demand book, so they get printed as they get purchased. Mm -hmm. So you can get it on Amazon. And I've just set it up with Ingram Spark, which is the wholesaler that deals with bookstores and libraries. So you can also go to a bookstore. And so now you can go to a bookstore and order, a, and they can order a copy for okay. you. Okay. Or you can go ask your library to order a copy, and then. Lots of people can read. All right. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Okay. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, great. Thanks.